<laughs> Come on, you in soccer. We trust YouTube family members. That doesn't really roll off the tongue that well. We got to workshop some nicknames for you guys. Anyway, we have another special guest coming on today. Philadelphia Union captain Alejandro Bedoya. So hit like and subscribe to show your appreciation for Ale. And let's get after it. Yes. What is up, everyone? And welcome to Justin Map, also known as Sippy's favorite podcast in soccer. We trust. I'm Jimmy Trashcan, Cream Cheese, Conrad Dino Conrad, alongside Charlie Chuck Wagon Davis and Hollywood Heath Pierce. And not only are we going to discuss all the happenings for the U.S. Men's National Team player pool from this weekend, where some of our players did great. I'm looking at you, Timo Weah, and some did not. I'm looking at you, Aaron Long. But we're also going to give a welcome to a very special guest of the show who was on the last national team that played in the World Cup. Oh, my God, I tripped over my words. Back in 2014, and is currently the captain of the Philadelphia Union, Alejandro Bedoya. But before we bring him on, what are we excited to talk to him about, Chuck? I'll go go to you first. What do you want to get into it with Ollie? Just his his mentality, how he's been able to be so consistent over the years. It's almost like he's he's gotten better over the course of of his career as he's as he's aged. Well, Charlie, that's generally what people and, do. They get better over their career, you know, just for the record. <laughs> well, I don't know. Whenever he gets this late, I mean, he's getting better. Uh, okay, now the now there's context around it. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you the context part. Yeah. Especially especially considering where he was. I mean, this was a Pringles uh, Coke kind of guy, and now all of a sudden he's. He's, he's this veteran leader who is just like demonstrating with with his performances every match for the best team in the Eastern Conference. So um, it's it's been awesome to watch him continue to, to boss the midfield. Okay, it's official, everybody. Charlie didn't really rate Alejandro Bedoya when he was younger, but definitely. <laughs> All right, Heath, what are you excited to talk about with Ollie? You call him the Pringles and Coke kind of guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, by the way. And th that if you if you have Pringles and Coke, that'll get you right into a team in Sweden. You know they love a good Pringles and Coke after a match on the bus home. You know, uh, but no, I'm I'm excited just to just to catch up with them again. As Charlie said, I know I gave him a little bit of a hard time, but this is a career year for him in terms of uh, certain certain statistics. And I think leading a team uh, in a different way as as he evolves uh, physically, I think is a, is a really interesting point. And also being part of this project that that is Philadelphia, it's not always easy to be one of the veterans having to constantly work with some of the young players, although the young players haven't exactly been uh, having the same role as we've seen in years past, but I'm excited to talk about it. All right. I'm excited hey, oh, wait, to talk oh, to him I as well. I just want to add this. Add Before it, add Jimmy it. goes with the intro, Jermaine Jones was known as being outspoken. My man went straight politician. Alejandro mm -hmm. Bedoya, outspoken, speaks his mind. I don't want to see him go straight politician. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Right? Let's it's a see. playoff let's match see. week. Let's, let's see what he says. Let's see what he's he says. A, he's got know? a big week. Let's just let's relax. Let's just relax. <laughs> All right. Without further Freddy ado, it's time for our tale of the tape. Standing five feet eleven inches tall, weighing 161 pounds, is the New Jersey born, Florida raised, Boston College attending, said no to the MLS Super Draft, and went straight to Europe, played in Sweden, Scotland, and France before coming home to be a vital leader and player of the Philadelphia Union. He's represented the U.S. On 66 occasions, including playing Jeez. in all four of our games in the 2014 World Cup, and his biggest claim to fame has to be that he got into a national team camp with me, Charlie, and Heath at various points of his career. It's Alejandro! <laughs> Ollie, what's up, dude? Great to see you. Wow, well. what an intro, guys. That's unbelievable. First of all, how do I get a nickname like that, Jimmy? And <laughs> what the hell is wrong with Pringles and Coke? Are you what? Come on. <laughs> I agree. Also, I just want to say for the record, this is my first question to you, Ollie, is that I picked the Philadelphia Union to win MLS Cup, and these other two guys went with LASC. And I'm just throwing it out there. I'm getting ahead of it. Yes, let's go, boys. Good, wow, good. Like I mean, just throwing good, under good, the, throwing us, throwing us yeah. under. You know? <laughs> Great teammate. On the bandwagon, you know. And yeah, I like that jersey. Yeah, I gotta I like respect it. that from Jim. Yeah, <laughs> just throwing it right out there. I, you know, he thought this was like I thought we had this brotherhood. You know, when you go on the national team together, you just kind of stick together. But Jimmy just quickly just threw us right under that one. <laughs> Well, that's well, why I just, I think Philadelphia's Charlie got the sauce. calling me a Pringles and Coke guy. Oh my gosh. Like, I hey, was a home on a Sunday league team. I'm just going <laughs> to make it. So, so, Ollie, uh, my real question then, you guys are having a terrific season with Philadelphia Union. You get that first round by. We've seen that that first round by for a successful team isn't always in the best interest of the club because maybe you lose a little bit of rhythm that you've established in the season. How are, how are you and the team kind of managing? watching other players and other teams play in the playoffs and you just kind of have to wait. 
Yeah, no, I think, well, this year is a bit different. You know, it's it's not like the other years where you did have to wait about like three weeks, you know, if you got right. that first round by. So that, that, that's better. Um, but yeah, I've seen some of the results and some of the score lines. Um, as Charlie knows, when you get kids, uh, it's tough. Or Jimmy as well. Heath, do you have any kids? I don't think you do. He's got like 17. <laughs> They're all girls. <laughs> yes, they know. Yeah. Um, no, but like, you know, <clears throat> It's just hard to watch games in the weekends, right? Because you have so many kids' activities and games and traveling everywhere. But no, I, I've seen the score lines, and you know, uh, you saw Austin yesterday go down at home 2 0, right? So it, it's not always easy, man. The playoffs is a different ball game, it's a whole new season. Anything can happen. But the, the, the most that we can do is just control what we can control. It. And we did that during the regular season. We have home field advantage. And, and I feel very strongly about, um, you know, our place at home, uh, you know, playing anybody and everyone that, that we will be dominant with our style of play and, and get results. So, you know, that's the game plan. We have a game plan right now, and hopefully we execute it and, and move on. No, Ali, uh, you know, at this point of the season, like you said, a playoff starts kind of kind of starts over regardless of, of, of the, the season you guys have been having. You've been part of this Philadelphia Union project for a while now. What do you think is the difference between, you know, obviously last year, 90 minutes and a bunch of COVID cases away from 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 reaching a final. But this year, um, just consistent throughout the year, arguably the best team in the league all season long. Uh, what is, what's the difference year over year that, that sort of keeps this thing moving forward without it sort of, you know, you see these projects and you go every fourth or fifth year, you got to start over, but this seems to keep continue to get better and better year in year out. Yeah, no, it's just that level of consistency we've shown is, is just incredible, you know, and it's tough to do in the league where it's so much parity, but a credit to all the guys who have come in, the, the, the players that have been scouted and brought into the team, you know, the, the academy doing well with the homegrowns, getting them ready uh, to come up. But, uh, you know, I think we've just set a, a, a certain standard and, and, you know, from a culture standpoint in the locker room, um, you know, whoever comes into the team just understands their roles very well. You know, Jim is a great man manager, which is important to be as a coach. And, um, and, and that's been the key to our success so far. So, you know, um, if we need to rely on the next man up, that, that guy knows what, uh, you know, his role, uh, knows the system of play that we have, which is, you know, unique to, to maybe us and maybe another one or two teams, but we, we execute our game plan game in and game out, you know, and, and everybody knows their, their roles and, and, you know, we might not play the prettiest soccer at all times, but our, our goal is, you know, to try to suffocate teams, make them uh, make mistakes and, and punish them. And, uh, you know, we've been able to do that very well in the second half of the season. Um, and we're hoping to do the same uh, here in the playoffs. Ali, I don't know if you can see the YouTube comments, but P. Morton's coming for you. He said, but Doya has his coach at a press conference demeanor down pat already. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a whiteboard um, behind him, too. He's got a whiteboard behind him. With, uh, yeah, if you guys want to go over the X's and O's. <laughs> All right, this, this right question now, is for huh? Coach Curtin. Could you move aside? Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, hey, no, but I will say this. You know what's changed a lot since I first came here? It, it's just the quality of player, too. You know, we might not have those key marquee guys, you know. Hell yeah, here they come. Here they come. But <laughs> yeah, here they come. You know, I think Charlie was on those teams, too. Like, when I first got here, I mean, let me tell you something. The biggest difference for me is our, at center back position. No disrespect to my previous teammates, and but but – that's been a huge upgrade, you know, upgrade in terms of the spine of a team. Guys that can hit a ball, ping a ball with laces, you know, diagonal switch of plays and playing through the lines. Like when I first came wild here, we got it's wild we got Austin Trusty on loan at Arsenal and you're throwing him <laughs> under the bus. We got Mark McKenzie at gang throwing him under the bus, you know, and now you got hey, uh, Austin, you do have the best Trusty. center back pairing in the league, you know. Trusty's <laughs> no. developed. Trusty's developed, but he couldn't do that when he first was here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. Hey, he would tell you that that's that's true. Uh, if you're looking at this next match, Cincinnati, they've played you tough in, in both occasions, right? They beat you handily in Cincinnati and in one, one draw in Philly, one, one of five teams to do it. What, what makes this, this matchup so difficult? Is it just because Pat Noonan knows you guys? Is it that simple? Chris Albright, Pat Noonan, they go, Hey, we've been in the locker room. We know how they operate. We know how they like to attack or, or is it down to the players that they have in Brennan Vasquez, Lucho Acosta and Brenner? Yeah, I think uh, I don't think it's just as simple as, you know, they know what, what we're all about and how to attack us and things like that. I think that's a good storyline, but I think it's more just the style of play, how they play. Um, there's not many teams in the league that play with two strikers up front. Right. And, and when you got a guy like Vasquez who can hold up the ball, who's strong on the ball, who's quick getting in behind, you know, he gives every, you know, uh, mm -hmm. defense a, a problem. And that's no different with our team, you know, um, so 
him and Brenner. Brenner's been having a great season this year. Um, and and with the Costa just drifting anywhere and everywhere, you know, behind them, they're they're a lethal attack. So and and they give every defense problem. That's no different. So our our defense has to be at their absolute best, you know, against them because uh, they'll punish you. But you know, we we know they they have weaknesses too, like every team. And 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 you know, we got a one one result here, which is disappointing at home. But um, I think we're, you know, uh, this is the playoffs and, and they're coming here in a hostile environment and we're going to do everything to, to kind of try to suffocate them and, and, you know, press them, get goal off of turnovers and, and not allow uh, a cost of too much time and space. Yeah, he's definitely the catalyst. You got to get a couple people around him for sure. But I actually want to get back away from this game a little bit. There's got to be some secret sauce that's happening with the Philadelphia Union Youth Academy. There's been plenty of names, uh, some we've already mentioned, and Brendan Aronson, obviously, and then his, his brother Paxton, and you got Jack McClay. You got a whole bunch of players. What? Uh, look at this. Every look at this. Before Jimmy, you get in. Look at this dorky photo of Paxton. <laughs> his, ar his arms awkwardly down by his side. Ollie. I mean, what's going on in this photo, man? I've got, got a hard case. Is he wearing a yeah, helmet on his head? Yeah. Like Lego. I, head. I've, I, I've got. Uh, I've. Uh, I've got it. It's a number card, so I'm keeping it. So it's going to be worth something someday. It better be. This guy's right. supposed well, to be good. That, if you need that signed, let me know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you. You must. Do you just kind of? Wow, we got another one of our players from the youth academy training with us today, and this kid can absolutely ball. I mean, it's just. It's pretty remarkable how consistently you guys are uh, producing these players. Yeah, when you say that, when and, and they do come up, you know, right away, I'm just going to make sure I smash them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the first team. Welcome kids. to the first team. No, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think, you know, what they've done here with the academy, just on the soccer side of things is, is, is incredible. But also, I think, um, you know, at the school that they have, too, at YIC, I got to give them credit, too, because a lot of them are are – or have a good head on their shoulders, you know. Uh, they got the right mentality as well. And they're they're willing to learn. Um, you know, Charlie was here as well, and you saw a lot of these guys always asking our experienced guys like ourselves, you know, questions, um, staying after uh, and to participate um, in in extra training, whether it was shooting, working on their finishing, working on their on their crosses, um, their turning, you know, things like that. So it's great, you know, and there's so much talent um, in the region, in the area. But even now I was recently at a game after one of our training they had like a tournament or something. And you got the U14s, U15, U16s. And these kids, I mean, they're getting them from all over the place. I mean, these guys are coming in from Cali, Arizona, Texas, like not even just in our region anymore. So, I mean, there's some good scouting going on, you know, and, and all this data and analytics now that, that's coming along. So it, it, it's fantastic. But uh, it, it's cool. And they're keeping me young and fresh, you know, because they're not just going to take my spot, uh, you know, easily. So um, they got to earn it. Well, I, I, that's what that's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it certainly seems like, uh, you know, you talked about laying a challenge into them. Uh, how how soon after the announcement of them moving to a new facility, the team moving to a new facility, it's going to be unbelievable. And you probably won't get to experience much of it once it's fully done. How how long after that did it take for you to lay into a challenge on a, on a young guy to be like, you know, these guys are going to get it good? Uh, how, long did, how, how long into the training before you laid a challenge into somebody on that one? Oh, no. Well, I'll just wait to see how they how they handle it. You know, you get some guys that, you know, maybe come up and, and are really confident and, you know, they want to try to step over to and, and try to make you. Well, the first guy that tries to make me forget about it. That next play, they're going down. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I my, my, my serious question is, is actually this. Right. So the new facilities they announced are going to actually bring the players together. So the the school, the players, the if there's a residency academy, all these things are going to come into one roof as the next step of this process of now having these players in and around the first team where they can experience it, having them down the hallway from a player like yourself who's played in a World Cup, how important is that in terms of the, the, the future evolution of the club and the next steps in that journey? I think it's, it's very important because I think part of uh, the process for, for a young player to learn is, is to see how the first team operates, see how you know the older veteran players or even the young, talented players who are on the first team handle themselves, right? How do they manage themselves, how they train, um, you know, how fiery it can get and, and just looking at, at the first team, how we train and how we go about things. So I think that that's part of the development. And I think it's crucial for everything to be in, in the same place, in the same area, uh, because I think that, that interaction, too, goes a long way. Like I remember even as a kid, you know, if you're able to cross paths 
uh, with the professional or whatever, um, you know, some a position that you aspire to. I think that that gives you real motivation. Um, and I think it's important to to have those, you know, moments where like maybe the first team is coming off the field and you're coming on with your team to, to go training or whatever. And, and you're able to just chit chat a bit um, or even get some feedback, you know. Um, so I think that's it's important and I think it's huge. And, and the center looks amazing. And I think it bodes well for the future of the, the union. I, I want to talk about your, your leadership qualities, captain, you know. You've played in Urubro in Sweden. You you went to Nantes. You went you went to Rangers, Helsingborg. Of all the captains that you've played for and with, who who whose kind of qualities have you tried to take with you? You know what what were some of those qualities that you appreciated versus the ones that maybe you thought not the best captain? I don't want to lead that way. Charlie, don't make him talk. Don't, don't make him say nice things names, about me. Right? There's, there's he's gonna get shy. Like, hey, he's gonna get shy he, saying that about me in front of me. You know, Charlie. Like, <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. No, I think I've taken a little bit out of everything, you know, because in, initially I, I was always a type of guy that just leads by example. Right. Like, you, you know, I'm going to put the work in. I'm going to put I, I grind it. I grind. I put the grind in and you're going to, you know, want to go after me because it's just the way I, I handle myself that, that you know, I'm you're not going to be let down. But over time, I, I understood that. I think that I thought I had to raise my voice, uh, you know, that guys weren't just going to just follow me based on my work ethic. That's part of it. But uh, I have to really show out and, and, and show them that I, I know what I'm talking about or, or that, that they can understand what I'm trying to, to, to play. Right. Because part of the understanding on the field is you have to be able to talk through things. Um, and I wasn't always the best, you know, cause I'm a passionate, fiery guy. So I can just, you know, F off or this and that. Sure. <laughs> really, really it get way too emotional. Right. And so I had to harness that. Uh, you sound into... like a dick. You sound kind of like a dick. I'm not going to lie. You know? so... <laughs> well, sometimes you got to be tough, but I think that's, passion. What, that's what I learned because, you know, some guys that, that were captains before, I didn't like how they handle their business. I didn't like the way they talk to you as if, if like they were the know it all and they, you know, you're always wrong and they're always right. Like I didn't like that. So I felt, you know, whether I let emotions get the best of me at certain times, like I knew that after training this, this we're all trying to get better. Right. So I got to put my arm around you. Um, the younger guy, whoever I was, you know, getting in a, an argument with or whatever, getting heated discussion with and just let him know, like, look, this is what I was trying to re uh, reference. And, you know, I think more and more now it's always about just like, look, this is, this is what, how I'd like you to improve. This is what I think you should be doing. How do you see it? And, you know, get that constant feedback and, and, and more conversational. And I think that's just how I handle my business now. And, and I'm willing to, you know, talk it out with everybody now, uh, more so than I used to, in, in, you know, in the past. Okay, so let's tie in some national team experience for you with what you're talking about right now, because similar to Heath, you were named to the 30-man roster in 2010, didn't end up making the final 23, but you did play for us in 2014. Tell us that transition and how you felt. We, we, know, uh, as we know a lot about Heath's experience and obviously massive disappointment, of course, but how did you balance that emotion and being emotional at that age and then making sure that you were ready come 2014 to make that team instead? Yeah, for that 2010 camp, I was kind of more like, you know, I was more of that like happy to be there kind of guy. You know, I hadn't really established myself yet. I had, you know, a good breakthrough season in, over in Sweden, but I felt like, you know, it, it was still kind of early. It was like shocked to be part of the, that camp. But yeah, that was kind of brutal. I remember that you get the phone call in your room and like, hey, come on down. Uh, and you go down and, okay, yeah, sorry, you're not going to make it. An okay. hour and a half after they were supposed to have us come down. Like, keep your phone yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he, he's not morning. bitter about it at all, by the way. Oh, no, 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 I was there. I, hey, I was just there to have fun, too, Alejandro, just for the record. I really, I really, yeah. I, I, had a good, I had a good time with the boys, so, yeah. Well, you were a little more established than I was at that, yeah. at that point. Yeah. So I can understand your frustration. But, no, I was obviously disappointed, but, like, of course, like I, I talked about, like, how do you harness that emotion and, and you know, propel yourself forward and, and, and come back better and, and, you know, next time. So by when 2014, you know, started rolling around, obviously 2012, 2013, leading up to that point, um, I, I had been I had been playing some good ball, you know, so I, I felt like, you know, I was really, really playing well. Uh, I had gone back to Sweden, reestablished myself, and, and and then went to Nantes in France, and 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 I was, you know, um, I would say I was playing some of my best soccer during that time. Between 2014 and 2016, I would say I was I was probably one of the most consistent national team players. I'm just saying I'm, that's facts. Yeah, we, we appreciate confidence. Yeah, so I, I think uh, no no ego aside, but yeah, I think that was just my my 
you know, I, I had the baseline, right, of what to expect with that 2010 camp. Like, who were, these are the guys that went, what was I lacking, what, why I didn't make it, how could I improve my game? And, and that's just what I worked on, you know. I, I think I just had to improve on both sides of the ball, make sure that I'm tactically very clean because I'm not the, the FIFA type of player that's going to do step overs like Charlie or some <laughs> thing. But just to, to make sure, you know, I get the tactical part of the game down and, uh, and, and you know, keep being able to be that possession type player that can connect, uh, you know, uh, defense to, to, to forward, so to strikers. So, yeah, I just took that on the head uh, and just kept pushing. And I knew that I had the talent because I had made it to 2010 and then I had the ability. And it's just uh, about just improving your play and, and being consistent. I think that's the biggest thing for professional players. And one thing I tell all the young guys here, you know, when you make it pro, you haven't really made it. You made it. Yeah. But consistency is key. And that's something that I re rely on. And I, I believe I have a very high minimum level. Yeah, I think, you, and if you look through your your stats, even with the national team, it was pretty consistent all the way through from the moment you established, just continuously being a contributor and going into 2018 on, on the leadership conversation. You know, you 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 experienced a lot with that group going towards 2018 World Cup and and the the failures that the team went to through, and the conversation there was the leadership, right? It was the is it the right leadership? Is it the wrong leadership? Is it the right coach? Is it the wrong coach? I don't want to focus as much on that, but you experienced that. Now, when you're looking at this group, brand new group in the national team, all young, you know, playing at big clubs or involved in big clubs and playing pretty consistently, but lack uh, what I think is, is some of those leadership things we've had in national teams past. Looking at this upcoming World Cup, what is your biggest concern or worry when it comes to the leadership aspect? We've had, you know, 11 different players wear the armband, whether you read into that or not. We've got a, a just a team that's all around the same age, right? We, I always look to veterans, and I know we always looked up to veterans, whether it's by example or, or, or just by pure experience. I mean, what is your biggest, I don't want to say concern, but what is the thing that you're looking at the most uh, on what's going to make this team successful in Qatar? Yeah, I think looking at, like, I know everybody was talking about the last two games and things like that, but I, I just think um, the group can sometimes be a little bit too naive, right? Like, we all want to play that pretty soccer, pretty football, the build up play. But I felt like what was lacking in these last two games is is sometimes just, you know, you got to be able to win dirty or win ugly and then get nasty, get fight. You know, it wasn't the best field. I, I watched a little bit of the Japan game before, uh, you know, after training here. Uh, and I just felt like, you know, the, you're just trying too hard to, to, to play a certain style of play. And you're so locked in that way that, um, you know, it, it, you know, you can't always win that way. And, and if it's not going right, you got to change it up. So, you know, get guys to get stuck in and, and maybe sometimes play a little bit more direct, win that second ball and, and you know, move on and, and get the ball in the final third. Um, so it's not. Oh, yeah, that's that's my that's always been my thing with this group. But there's no doubt so what this, you're saying is you could be in the group right now. This group is, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that. I know you could. But you're you but you're be, not you can, you're not not saying that. You know, yeah, no, I think I think early on, I think early on I always thought I could have, you know, still added something over some of the guys yeah. that were that were still seeing some time, you know, and, and it was a transitional period of I get that, but you know, I, I still still feel I could give something. But uh no, I think uh look um they're so talented they got guys obviously playing for huge clubs um so uh i wish them all the best but that's that's the one thing that i would say you know in terms of lacking leadership or things like that is sometimes maybe you need somebody to step in there and be like yo guys it's not freaking working let's go route one win the second ball in their final third and then we can play from there you know um because i would hate for us to you know get and lose on a, on a silly turnover trying to play out of our right. hard box a hundred percent spot on with you. And Kellen Acosta came on last week and he said, Hey, these MLS guys are getting unfair uh, criticism versus the European guys. You've played in both. You've played in the world cup. You've played in Europe. You've played in MLS. You, you're balling. You've balled in all over the world. Do you feel that is the case? And, and, and looking at this front three, where would you put Christian Pulisic? Would you put him in that left wing position with this this current setup, or would you have him more centrally? Because you've you've also seen Christian Pulisic come to the the full team. How do you interpret his involvement with with the group and, and tactically? Now you're asking me to like pass my soccer coaching license. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think I always 
seeing him like a, like a somebody who, who, who needs a, a free role, right? Because he is a special player, but how does he fit into a certain system? You can't just peg him in somewhere. But I think it's, it's tough right now. You know, we just still haven't been able to get that pure number nine, right? And, and guys are calling for different guys to be that number nine. But there's nobody that has been shown that consistency that we need at the position, right? Um, but I think with, with somebody like Christian being able to play underneath, you know, can you rely on Reyna who is so talented, but he's, you know, injury prone, it sucks. You know, I feel bad for him. I, I feel for him. Um, because, you know, with those two guys, uh, and, and I really like Musa, the way he plays and carries the ball forward, um, you know, having a number nine with Reyna and, and Pulisic underneath them. And, and, and you got to include Aronson in the conversation. That's the, that's the biggest thing for me is like, who, who do you fit? Like, who's going to come in with more confidence and, and you know, and, and and things like that between those three guys? It's it's it, he's got a big, big decision to make. Um, but, yeah, I just I think Pulisic, I, I liked what I saw from his last cameo with Chelsea. I think maybe not his last one, but the one before that where he was able to get more out on, on, on the end line. And then you see him have more space that when he receives the ball, he just is so direct and, and is willing to go at that defender. And, and that guy has to make tough decisions and, and he's able to make things happen. So I, I do like him playing out on the left, being able to come inside on his right foot and, and be really direct. <clears throat> so. I love that Coach Bedoya is with us today, everybody. So this is nice. Yeah, how uh, did this turn into this? <laughs> Jimmy, 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 before you, oh, hey, before you ask a question, I just want to point out that Charlie's brother's in the comments right now saying that he made you back in the day. Is there some truth to that? That he made? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> There's no chance. No that chance? Was yeah, that was one of his dreams in Stockholm. I, I, just, I, just, I just want to point out that it was right around the 20th minute mark when you, when you, when you shot back at Charlie for the stepovers thing, and then all of a sudden – you know, yeah, we started just, getting the comments in there. So <laughs> he was, he's got your, he's got Charlie's back saying he, he made you. So I thought maybe, I thought maybe a step overs was a Boston college thing since you guys both went to Boston college, you and Charlie. All right. So one of the traditions that we have here, Ollie is Jersey swaps. We need your, your best Jersey swap of all time of your career. And maybe your biggest regret where you went in there, asked somebody for one and they kind of gave you the no the, the Kembe Matumbo finger saying not, not this time. Uh, what, what do you got for us? Who's the best Jersey swap and who's your biggest regret? The best jersey swap. Yeah, who's uh, hanging up in your house right now, framed? <laughs> I got nobody. I got nothing hanged up on my house, actually, to be to be honest. And you're an art guy. Because he's got his, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, well, yeah, that's because yeah. that expensive art is on the wall. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, there's exactly, no room exactly. for that. But no, I, oh, man, that's a tough question. Put me on the spot. I would say... Um, I, I, I think like Slaton. Sl I think yeah. Slaton was a, was a cool jersey when he was. I at would PSG. say that's pretty cool. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, when he was at yeah. PSG, and, and what's funny, the, 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 there's a long story short. You know, my, my wife is a physiotherapist. But, you know, she's uh, worked in Sweden. Charlie knows. And when I first went to Sweden, of course, like Slaton's a folk hero there, right? In Sweden, so everybody looked up to him. So I, I thought for, when I got to play him, against him in, in France um that was cool and then we linked up in a tunnel after and we were just talking because he I, we, I talked in swedish i was talking shit to, or can i curse i don't know I was yeah talking sure go for it him. yeah we were talking shit i was talking shit to him in swedish on the field <laughs> um and then uh he asked me after how did i know swedish and i told him a little background story and ha and my wife had actually worked in the in the similar clinic in in malmo back in sweden with him and, and he actually remembered that so that was that was pretty unique that was pretty cool that was cool that's a good one. What about what about one? What about regret? biggest regret though? When who, the who, biggest who, regret? Who turned um, you down? <laughs> Who'd you go for and didn't get it? No, well, no, I, not not that I didn't get it, but I'm not going to name any names. But it was in France, uh, a swap with a player, and um, the jersey smelled terrible after the game. <laughs> even after the watch, <laughs> it was lingering and it was terrible. I just had it. Actually, I just got rid of it. <laughs> I won't name it. it. <laughs> wow. I, I will say the smelliest player I ever played against was Shevchenko. We had a, a MLS All-Star game against Chelsea, and I think he purposely smelled bad because I didn't want to be anywhere oh, around him. I was like, I'll go – you know what? I'll go Mark Drogba instead because you smell like absolute ass. But oh, I didn't know. Yeah, maybe yeah. it was a culture <laughs> thing. Maybe it was a competitive uh, thing. I have no I knew, idea to I knew, this day, I knew, but I like it. I knew uh, Bedoya asked for Cristiano Ronaldo's T-shirt when they were hanging out together in South Florida. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Confirm or deny before we let you go, Alejandro Bedoya. No, that is could not be more false. Uh, <laughs> I bet hey man, let me get that T-shirt. Let good, me get that T-shirt. You don't need that. They're, they're hanging out in the fountain blue together. Oh, we're talking about the World Cup, and then he said, 
By the way, hey, uh, Christian, could I get your T-shirt? Alejandro Padoy, everybody. You'd be hanging out by the pool. He'd always walk up to the shower. That was outdoor shower, you know, by the pool. And just. I don't uh, think he actually wears a T-shirt <laughs> when he's by the, uh, by the pool. Yeah, Invisible sure. T-shirts. Alejandro Padoy, good luck on Thursday against FC Cincinnati, Philadelphia Union. Ball that game kicks off at 8 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you check it out and support this man in the Philadelphia Union against FC Cincinnati. Ali, thank you so much for your time and for your insight. Yes, we wish you the best of luck. Let's go, boys. Woo! That was Alejandro Bedoya. We are in Soccer We Trust. We're going to take our first and only break of the show. When we come back, we'll do a little recap of all the U.S. men's national team players and what they did this particular weekend. Don't go anywhere. The UEFA Champions League on Paramount Plus. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. That's brilliant. With more magic and more drama. While a former Bavarian nails the back of the net in Barcelona, an American trades his stars with zebra stripes, and a Norwegian creates sky blue spectacles. Oh, so stream every sweat, so second of regulation time, stop his time, and extra time. Beyond magnificent. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount Plus. Welcome back to In Soccer We Trust. I'm Jimmy Conrad alongside Charlie Davies and Heath Pierce. And we just had an awesome interview with Alejandro Bedoya, who I actually forgot. I mean, I knew he was part of the 2018 team that didn't didn't uh, qualify. But he really has gone through every emotion I think he possibly can, where he was one of the last cuts in 2010, made the team in 2014, got through the group of death, and then, and then didn't qualify for 2018. He should write a book. That's pretty much what I am going to say. Charlie... He's a fellow Boston College player, and uh, thank you for wrangling him to get him on the show, along with everybody else, our producer. What what uh, what stood out for you with regard to anything that he said? Because because uh, he's really echoing the same things that we're talking about with the U.S. Men's National Team in particular. Yeah, I, I would just talk about his leadership and his ability to get the most out of players and the 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 emotional roller coaster he's he's had to to, to ride in terms of his career, not getting the credit he deserves fighting for everything he's earned. Um, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, he's, he's just a, a top professional and one that continues to deliver for the Philadelphia union year after year and people count him out and he still delivers and you hear him talk and you're like, we could use a player on the US <laughs> Men's National team like that. You know, this is a player who's playing every week for the best team in the Eastern conference and, you know, top two in the league. And, he could he could be that midfielder who you know could could come into a, a, a game where we need to to gr grind it out you know you're talking about a, a a professional who has seen it all who can who can organize who can rally the troops you know both the emotional leader not that this team desperately needs it but i'm 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 not saying that they desperately need it and i'm not saying that they do desperately desperately need it Phil, i really believe that alejandro bedoya is is one of those players that is a locker room guy um, can hold people accountable and and maybe for a young group of players could could be you know someone who who would be valued. Ah, oh, that would be amazing, Alejandro Bedoya for the national team, almost, almost like a player assistant coach kind of role, you know, where he could do a little <laughs> exactly. bit of both because he obviously got a tremendous insight. I want to give a shout out to Lisa Roman who is in the chat right now. She also hosts the Attacking Third, one of our podcasts, the podcast family for CBS Sports. Make sure you check that out for all things women's soccer. They got it down, and it is awesome, and I highly encourage you to go subscribe to that as well. Heath Pierce, how about you? Alejandro Bedoy, anything that he said that stood out for you? Um, also, shout out Lisa and, the, and their social handles. If you put those notifications on, you are up to date on everything going on in the women's <laughs> game, which is amazing. It hits my phone, and I, I, I don't have to scroll the Twitters all day long for, for things. But, yeah, for, for, for Bedoy, I think it was it, it's, it, it's interesting because uh, in retrospect, just thinking about this, you realize that there's outside of 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 um, I'm blanking on his name at right back with us right now. Uh, we don't, uh, DeAndre Yedlin. Yedlin. No, Yedlin. DeAndre. Yedlin. No, De DeAndre Yedlin. There's not one person that those players can look to and say, "Oh, okay, Alejandro Bedoya fell short in 2010, right? Just starting his professional career, but got a taste of it. Then he was in 2014, went through the failures of 2018, and now he can look them at, look be in a locker room in the worst of times, and you look somebody like that in the eyes, and they they've got something to give you, right? whether that's words, whether that's action, whether that's experience, we don't have that in this team. And I think that was more of a highlight than anything of just who do you go to? Who does this team turn to? And I get the idea of a new generation. These guys have gone through it. They've grown close. But I wonder, is there one or two players when we're thinking about, could it be a, you know, and again, do they fit the system? I don't know. But is there one or two players 
that haven't been involved that you just need around. Shit, just bring them to sit in the locker room. Just have, <laughs> be like, hey, special advisor just, to the just team. For the I vibes. need somebody who's been. I mean, I know Greg Berhalter did that, but you know, once you cross that line into management, it's it's a lot harder. Yeah, you can rely, you can lean on that in your coaching and take the things you like and don't like. But we're going to go into a locker room with a bunch of guys who can't look at anybody who's done this before outside of Greg Berhalter or or his staff. And I think there, I, I don't know. We we talked to Kareem oh, Abdul-Jabbar so does- before the 2010 World Cup. Like, who is it that you can bring in? And I, I say this because I, I watched the Redeem team and they were bringing in somebody every day from the military or whatever to motivate these guys. Like, who can you actually have around this team going into this to actually just give some of that information to the squad? So even though they don't have it, they feel like one, they've got somebody right. They got somebody from another generation writing for them, but also just giving them pieces of information that will help them when times get tough because hopefully it goes glorious. But like, you know, once they get punched, once they give up that first goal, can they, can they get out of that? And that's what I feel like is so crucially missing in this group in terms of that experience. So, so before we get into the recap and and we obviously have a lot of players to talk about, but I want to talk Chuck about Tim Ream because he actually yeah. hasn't played in the World Cup. He was part of the team that failed to qualify for 2018. I was in New York when we lost 2-0 against Costa Rica, and he didn't look great in that particular game and a must-win game for us to make everything a little bit easier before we ended up not doing that. So he's been a part of it. Obviously, he's captain of a Premier League team. He's been excellent this season with Fulham. I would love to see him go, but maybe that experience you're talking about, Heath, with a, like a like World Cup experience. Only DeAndre Yedlin has it. I, I don't even know if it's World Cup experience. You don't, you don't, you don't need World Cup experience. I mean, it could be. It's the failures of not making a World Cup team. Like, all I those mean, things. through that it. Make, yeah, yeah, it's not necessarily, like, circumstantial. He's played in big tournaments. He's played in big games. He's he's failed, right? He's been right. – he hasn't accomplished – It's an important certain, part of experience. It's an important, it's important part of being able to share yes. experience. It's not uh, just I about, think, like, hey, I've been I think here. It's, I think it just comes down to perspective. It's not It's not so much did you play in a World Cup, did you, did you fail here – it's about perspective and having that ability to read the team and knowing when to push guys, when to give guys some, some, some belief. I, I know you brought up Tim Ream and, and this also, I think goes to if producer Alex could throw up that tweet from Hercules Gomez going at Stu Holden for, for, for the center backs, but you know, Tim Ream, he has this performance against Bournemouth that I think someone said, Oh, he didn't get beat, you know, but it's Bournemouth. This isn't Chelsea. This isn't Liverpool. This isn't this isn't Arsenal. This isn't Tottenham. This is Bournemouth. So you know that you have to look at the grand sc- scale of 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 competition and and where he fits in. And he's he's still a liability if you play in high line. That that's never going away. He's still a liability if he has to run out to the touchline and defend. That's never going away. But if you choose to sit back in def- defend and have your center backs try and play balls into the channels or or have you know ball playing center backs and yes that fits but that's not how we've been playing so unless greg berhalter changes things or or realizes hey maybe we, we don't have all the players if chris richards can't get healthy because of the the muscle muscular problems he's having then he's going to be forced to bring in a new center back and of the new center backs who have still been kind of within the group it's probably Tim Ream because he's playing every week in the premiership. Um, I know John Brooks was brought up with Hercules Gomez. John's, John Brooks played in one game, and it was a cup game versus Caldas. And they they, t- they tied 1-1 in the game, and he and he was one of the lowest rated players in the match. So that he's not getting a call up, and he, sh- and he shouldn't get a call up. And so I don't want to hear about John Brooks because – People don't aren't putting into the equation. Yeah, he might have the talent, quote unquote, but what's the personality like? I've heard a lot of stories. I'm not even going to get into it, but I've heard a lot of stories that doesn't translate well into maybe being a third or fourth choice center back in this in this team. So yeah, there's I there's a lot to unpack with our center backs in general. We're going to get into but, Walker Zimmerman and Aaron Long it, it, here it, in a little bit, but I mean, I, I want to get into this at, at a certain point. I'd love for us to actually break it down because right now. From pundits, experts, fans, Chris Richards is the answer. Chris Richards' last 90 minutes was in, I believe, uh, I actually, I, I have it right here. Uh, looks like uh, September 11th, 2021 for the, his club team. Okay. Let's get into it We now, are then. in, wait, wait, we wait, are, we are. That's his last what? Last 90, 90 minutes. At, at, the, at the club level. Cl- club level 90 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, 
Over a year ago was his last club level 90. I, I believe. I don't think he started one. He hasn't started one, right, for, for Crystal Palace in an, a, a league match, right? It's been mostly just a couple of a uh, minutes here, and he's had maybe 45 somewhere. That is the guy that we're talking about who hasn't had a big game for the <laughs> national team. And I, listen, I want I, I want to I want to poke holes in all this because we look at one moment for Aaron Long got absolutely burned and everybody's waiting for that. I could take videos of all of you guys having a crap game and run on it. But what I'm saying for Chris Richards specifically, no, but this is, I hope this he's is, fit. Doesn't not, exist. This I agree. Is not one one moment. You know, this is no, no. this is a. But what up. I'm saying is generally. It's people are taking one moment and using that highlight to tell to tell a story. I'm not saying that's, uh, how, they always, uh, that's how they always uh, do yeah. it. I know, but I'm not saying it. I'm not. I'm not saying that. That's not. That's that's not that how they always do it. I'm just saying, right? The people are mounting on. Aaron Long is in horrible form right now. He's not confident. I think our, a lot of our national team players are aren't in great form right now. But when we talk about Chris Richards, this is a guy who hasn't played 90 at the club level in over a year, and because we have such bad form of our center backs. He is number three on our list. <laughs> like the, the, to me, that is insanity. It, I, when you have a player like a Tim Ream who's been playing, John Anthony Brooks, I get it. Hasn't played out of the picture. All those things get it. Tim Ream's a different, a, a different conversation. Guys that are playing at the club teams are a different conversation. Mm-hmm. But to just automatically keep moving Chris Richards up the depth chart when he hasn't played it ninety minutes in over a year at the club level, and he but hasn't he had playing, a huge. He's playing in the prem. I mean, he's playing minutes. He's getting minutes in the prem. It's not, he's not playing 90 minutes and not playing at all. He's playing oh, for I mean, a team. He, he like was Crystal playing Palace. like three minutes, five minutes, and then he played like 30 minutes. Like, okay. Is but that, still and, the then he, and then he, Crystal Palace and, and yeah, two but, center backs above him who are going to start regardless of, of who was, who was the third, fourth choice that like two full yeah, internationals. But, There's a big difference between playing for a, a but I don't want to use this and I don't want to take any credit away from players playing at the, these clubs, but playing for Vancouver Whitecaps versus being the third center back choice at a Crystal Palace. There's a big difference. Now, I also say Walker Zimmerman starting center back, Aaron Long, both started center backs last window. They're out. They're not playing a competitive match until over a month from now. So you can go to a camp, but they're not playing a competitive match. Yeah, they're yeah. both out of form, and they're not playing for over in a in a competitive match for ninety minutes in over a month. So camp. Okay, and for for so the for record, me, by the way, Chris, it, it, you should give Rickers context to everybody here. Is, though is moving is is got to be moving up this depth depth chart just because one he's playing, he's got a, a, a an important part of of the Celtics back uh, Celtic back line, and he's playing every match, playing Champions League. I think just by f- default. He's now moving up, up, up the, up the depth chart. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I just want to give context for everybody that hadn't been following the MLS playoffs. Just started this past weekend, and Walker Zimmerman and Nashville lost to the Galaxy. So now he's out. So to give some understanding to what Chuck is saying, there's going to be a camp for players to get knocked out on MLS early with Greg Berhalter and the coaching staff, but they're not going to play a meaningful game. They might get a friendly, from what I understand, but that's still maybe closed door. I don't. It's not going to be maybe as competitive as we would like, obviously. And then, and then Aaron Long lost uh, at home as captain of the New York Red Bulls and didn't look good on the last goal. Brandon Vasquez basically outran and outmuscled him to get to the ball with five minutes remaining, and uh, Cincinnati won 2-1, and that's why they're playing against Philly and Alejandro Bedoya on Thursday. So, so what I wanted to jump in and say is I see some rhetoric online that talks about, like, what's the window before somebody loses their match fitness or their match sharpness? And I saw some people going five months – six months i'm no. like are you guys <laughs> goddamn uh, insane like like it with with it, let's let's just use it as in basic normal one stuff month. if you have month, if you haven't worked out sure. charlie if you don't work out for two weeks just two weeks you're like you know what i gotta just rest for two weeks you know how hard it is to get started again and and to try to like regain where you were before you got hurt it's cr- it's it's it, just it not that take, you don't it, I, 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 I do think you can. I do think you can have a periodization plan that keeps your p- fitness at, you at can. close. It's not you match can. fitness, but you can keep something. Yes. But that's different than the mental and physical aspects of a, a game, right? You can't simulate mm-hmm. game, but you could keep your baseline at eighty to ninety percent. But you, you there's could. no way that you can keep that sharpness. Uh, the that sharpness goes along is with. different. I agree with yes. you on the physical side, but the emotional and 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 mental side, the decision making side, all you lose all that very quickly. Now, to your point, Charlie, which is where I think you were going to go, you can regain that very quickly as well yes. because you're built that way. Right. But but 
we need to see but these it, guys it, getting yeah. matches. Then you, they need to be playing. So to your point about Chris Richards, oh, that's great. He's playing for the Premier League, but if he's not, if he's not playing games and being in these these high pressure situations to make decisions quickly, it's gonna. We I don't want that to start against Wales. You know, well, I mean, well, there, I, there's, there's a difference between being healthy and being in training and coming in as a sub versus what Chris Richards is now, which is injured. Which is that means you're not training at all. That's the big drop off from competing every week, not getting matches, so you're not match fit, and your sharp sharpness may be off versus nothing, which means you lose all fitness, all sharpness, and have to rebuild yourself up. There's a big difference between the two, and Chris Richards has been injured, injured. So right, right, you're, right. You, you have Chris Richards who's injured, injured, and everyone's saying he's one. How can he be one? It's he's one if he's, if he's fit and not playing. He's not, he's not even training. So that comes down. Then you have Long and Zimmerman, who have, are both out of the playoffs, haven't been, haven't looking looked sharp. Chris, um, I'd say Aaron Long has has really regressed as of late. And then so so now you have Mark McKenzie who's playing, but doesn't have the trust yet of of, of Greg Berhalter. Cam, Cameron Carter Vickers, who is a captain, plays a big part of, of, of Celtics back line. I think he Austin trustee who hasn't been called in, James Sands, been, who who hasn't hasn't performed. I think those guys, just because of how things gone, if they so haven't been in, in at all, I don't think they they get called in at this point. Right. If you haven't been part of the process at all, a la Austin Trusty, he's not getting called in now for the World Cup. Oh, I agree. No, I, I think but, he's but, too but, far but, out of it. But but no, yeah, Heath, I, this is what, like, what I'm picking up. This is what I'm picking up. Do you, so based on form, you're saying that – I'm not saying you're saying this, but I'm I'm you're insinuating that you would go with Tim Ream and potentially Cameron Carter-Vickers to start or Mark McKenzie to start? Uh, against no, no, I, I'm still – I'm just yeah, curious because that's where this is, I, I think, going to go for as a discussion. Again, it just depends. Well, part of that's the coach, right? It's really hard for me to think about Greg Berhalter, who's a system-based guy, and him going, throw the system out. We're gonna go with what we have. What well, I'm you don't trying have to, to throw get the to system out completely, though. I mean, you can yeah. Still I mean, we adapt. can't. W- w- no, because when we're best is when we're playing in a high line, and and Tim Ream's not the guy that I want in a World Cup playing in a high line. Plain and simple, right? If we're playing in a in a deep block, if we're setting up in a deep block, then okay. I, I don't mind a Tim Ream. I'm happy to have Tim Ream because he's good on the ball. When you defend in deep blocks and you need somebody who can pass out of the lines after you defend for periods, he's really right. good at passing. Right. He has a range of passing. He can he can he can cover the field in, in terms of his ability to pass. What I'm trying to get to on the Chris Richards thing is every is just either let's say Chris Richards is climbing the charts because everyone else is bad, or stop talking about Chris Richards because Chris Richards has not proven anything. Now the other guys may have proven themselves out, but Chris Richards, who has a ton of potential, is a fantastic player potentially has not shown anything in the last 12 months that suggests that he should be a two in our national. I don't, I don't agree with that. Why? I don't Because he's played matches with crystal pass. He's come in the game. He's Charlie, shown that he can compete, that he 40, can tackle 47 can total minutes. 47, 47 total, total minutes. minutes. I, 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 all I need is five minutes. And I can tell you if a player is going to make a difference on this team or not. That's fair. Listen, pass, we're all Chris Richards it, fans. It's, it's not about it's it's no, no, whether he's sharp. It, it, yeah. If the center back's going to pass it to the other team with no pressure, you you. But you're telling you need, me, you need, you're mm-hmm. telling me a guy, if Chris Richards plays 47 minutes between yeah. now and the World Cup, that mm-hmm. he's a starting center back for you? Mm-hmm. He, he would he be played a starting 19, center he would he played 19 a, games in the Bundesliga last year. Yeah. And yeah. since that, since coming back from, from injury, mm-hmm. whatever. He played one uh, – his last match was in August of last year. Then he played a cup match against Oxford of League One uh, mm-hmm. where he played 90. And mm-hmm. in that minute, he's going to have a total of 90 minutes over like an 18-month mm-hmm. play- period with his club team. And you're saying because he's around good players every day that he's starting in a World Cup. I would start him if he was healthy, but he's not healthy. But he, he, li- he will be if, healthy if, come World Cup time. If In theory, if he's healthy maybe, come World Cup time, maybe, he's on the field. Maybe, no, but I'm saying he, in a world – that he's yes. healthy come World Cup time, he's starting in your in your national team. If if he is perfectly Cup. fit in an ideal world, injuries behind him, he's match fit, he would be starting in the World Cup. Yes. Well, whoever starts for us though has to be nails because the second guessing of that position is going to be off the charts if we don't play well or don't get a good result. Like, well, why do we go with Richards? He's only played 47 minutes for Crystal Palace this season. Or why do we go with Cameron Carter Vickers? We know we can't play a highlight with that guy. Or why do we I'm go not with saying Lockerman? don't play? I'm not saying I'm don't play saying, Richards, I'm, by the way. I'm saying don't make this about Chris Richards. Make it about the fact that 
Tim, uh, Tim Ream hasn't been in the national team. That's fine. You don't want to bring him in. Great. Chris Richards has been involved in the national team. Make it about Aaron Long not being informed. Make it about Cameron Carter Vickers not being at the level that you want at the international level. But it, this is not a this is this is an other people thing there for Chris Richards. This isn't Chris Richards having proven why he should be a starter well, in the national he, team. He proved, That's the he argument. Proved, that he I'm proved, no, well, he proved it last year in the Bundesliga. He proved it. That, that's all you need. It's just like Christian Pulisic. You don't, if he doesn't play another minute for Chelsea, does he need to prove anything? No, he's proven it before in the past. Yeah, but this guy, but he's this guy's, this guy's won a Champions League with Chelsea. That's different than a than a twenty year old but, kid but, who played but, but half the whole, of the games last season. The whole point is he's not playing. He's not playing at all. Christian Pulisic is is a unused substitute. Right There's now, nuance there, Potter. though, Charlie. You got to acknowledge the nuance. It's different. Yeah, there. Uh, my, it's a general statement. Of oh, sure, sure. Chris Richards is not coming out of nowhere. He's played a full season in the Bundesliga. He's he's played with the national team. He's starting World Cup qualifiers. He has experience, and he's gotten a move to Crystal Palace. Now, you could argue, is that a great move if you know you're going to be number three and you got to wait your chance, or you just go in there? Well, that was the risk he took. Number. Right, the same thing that but Josh you're Josh yourself. Did you're saying I want to go. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, he could only be a starter if one of the two center backs got injured or suspended. Then you take your opportunity. That hasn't happened. And on top of that, he's gotten injured, right? So the whole point of this conversation, I think, is with Chris Richards, who was already elevated as like the number one center back, has been out, not even training and playing for the right. past at least four weeks, five weeks. What do you do now when you don't have one center back who has been in Greg Berhalter's, you know, top four depth chart, who's in form, what, where do you go from here? <laughs> Big questions, baby. Big questions. I, I don't know. We <laughs> yeah. can have a, we'll probably have to break this down. I, we're, I, we're still actively trying to get Miles Robinson on. Obviously he tore his Achilles and was playing very well for us before that. And uh, we're going to see if we can get him on here in the next couple of weeks to, to give us his own insight on who <laughs> he probably won't say. And I understand why, but it'd be fun to get his insight on, on some things as a center back for Greg Berhalter. Jimmy, All right, let's, real, real quick on, 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 on that. I wanted to give one, one contextual point. I remember specifically playing and this uh, to, to kind of go against my own argument I re, or kind of with it as well. I remember playing games because the person who was in my position was out of form, not because I was, considered the best option or because my situation was perfect. Maybe I wasn't playing. And I remember going to Wembley, not playing games at the club level. And it was because either Johnny Bornstein was injured or, or Bob thought he was out of form that I was getting, getting the minutes. So it's never in a, you never have the perfect world where the best player is playing the most minutes in the biggest club. And therefore yeah. they, they win the argument in every way there's, there's holes in everything. And it's, and it's, and it's fluid. I just wanted to point that out that it's not, you're never going to have a situation where, you know, Christian Pulisic is a perfect example of that. No, no, no. And I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's an, an important injection of insight, let's say, to kind of balance out what we're trying to say. And, and uh, yeah, I like I like this. It's a great conversation. And I think that's one we're going to continue to have. As it ain't John Anthony Brooks, blessed. Jimmy. It ain't John Anthony Brooks. <laughs> it's not John Anthony Brooks. No, it's definitely not him. It, I think Tim Ream is the, is the one that uh, we should all yeah. be considering in, in a really legitimate way. And I guess the one thing I'll add before we move into some of the big – uh, positive stuff that's happening with our team for some of our players. <laughs> is there anything? Yeah, there is. Team away in okay, particular. Nice. But but I was going to say that if Tim Ream is our guy or, or they bring him in and we're going to, okay, and John or Cameron Carter Vickers is the one next to him or whoever it is, it's okay if, if we're as good as we think we are, if if we're as smart as we think we are, as we are talent, we should be able to adapt to these certain things with certain players that are in the team. If Pulisic was out and all of a sudden and we were missing somebody, we got to put somebody else that's not maybe as dynamic as him. We adjust. That's what you do. And then you try to put your best foot forward to make that happen. So at times it gets me a little frustrated that we couldn't like, okay, we want to play a high line, but we're not even with the guys that want to play a high line. Doesn't mean we're going to play a high line the whole goddamn game. And that's not even really a smart choice to do. The game is fluid and they're going to get mm -hmm. some possession. And we got to figure out how to do it. Anyway, now I'm getting heated. Let's get to the positive stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right, making his second appearance after returning from injury, Timo Wham made the most of his 25 minutes for Lille. He set up two goals from the right wing in four minutes in Lille's 3-0 win over Strasbourg. And I'm talking Charlie, real assists, not MLS ones, where it's like, you know, 
two or three passes back and get on the score sheet <laughs> to get that bonus. You know, that's fair. I got a couple of those assists, so I have plenty of time for those types of assists. And, and me too. Uh, I'm not arguing mine. Yeah, I won't tell you which I, ones I, I mine I'll were take actual. It. Nobody yeah. really knows. They don't know want to know the details of my ten assists in my career, but about four or five of those were those like second or third assists. Now, Charlie, let's talk about Timo Weah. What I loved about his performance when he came in, obviously very bright, very confident, but I loved that his purpose. Like he got the ball wide, and he knew exactly what he wanted to do. And sometimes. Mm -hmm. When I'm watching players in our player pool, especially ones that maybe are on the precipice of, are they getting time? Are they coming back from injury? They're just a little unsure of themselves for whatever reason. It could be a number of reasons. But Timo Weah gets the ball, does what he does best, gets to good spots, and still has success to create these two assists. And I love that about him. And we need that type of purposeful play with our national team come November 21st against Wales. Yeah. Uh, what I also loved is the, the service that he had. I mean, the first assist was whipped across the six, low, hard smashed it across right to Jonathan David's foot. And the second assist is he still gets to the end line, but instead of just doing what he did and had tremendous success, just lashing a ball across the six, he opts for the cutback. So he has the vision to see the right. run from the midfielder. Phenomenal. That 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 is what we need on the national team. Someone who is more aggressive, who's going to get to the end line, but can see the different options and is, is capable of connecting that pass, making sure that that pass gets to the player. So in terms of Eunice Musa, Weston McKinney, when they make those runs at the top of the, the box, they're finishing and, and they're getting the the, the ball. So um, I, I'm I'm a big fan of Team Awea and, and he's getting fit at the right time, confident and fit because we're going to need him in, in Qatar. We're going to need him, I think, Jimmy. I think he's starting, Heath. I think he starts. What I also like about yeah. that, and what, what adding on to what Charlie said, Heath, and I'll let you jump in is the fact that Strasbourg probably knew what Team Awea does well, and yet he still did it, right? And I think that really speaks to his quality as well, that uh, they know what he likes to do. They know what he likes to get, you know, go to his right, go to the end line, and he was still having success making that happen. And, and uh, man, I hope that continues against the Wales on November 21st. Go ahead, Heath. When, I mean, our team hasn't always been great with Team Awea on the field, but it hasn't been great with anybody in any rotation on the field, right? That's why we're having this conversation. But our team has always been the most predictable in where our goals and output are going to come from when he's on the field, right? You know what he's going to do, which means the trigger for a Charlie Davies is to get in the box, get into a place that you might score. Now, whether we score that or not is, 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 is the next step of that. But with him, he gets down to the touchline. He whips the ball in. And yeah, he puts his foot on the ball at times, but it is the most predictable our team ever is in terms of watching passively or actively as a fan or as an analyst, you know what's going to happen next when he gets the ball in wide areas. It's not like, uh, am I going to put my foot on it, keep the ball or not do anything? When he knows it's time to run at somebody, he runs at somebody, and the next thing is a cross. And I think that simplicity in the game, while it is an art form, like you said, Jimmy, people know he's going to do it, but he still does it and he does it well. It, it is really important for us in the attack to at least start creating, you know, Soccer 101 at times, which helps us build our confidence. I think I agree with Charlie there that just that that willingness to get down to the touchline and do something with it. We don't always need to walk the ball into the goal. We don't need to do something special because guess what? Right now, we're not doing anything in and around the goal. We need him on the field to do that. Yeah, I'm excited to see how he plays and continues to get minutes with Lille. It's going to be really important. All right, resident number nine, Charlie Davies. Let's talk about our number nines. Uh, Josh Sargent, uh, 14 games played in the championship with Norwich, uh, eight goals, just scored his eighth goal this past weekend and two assists for Norwich this season. Confidence for me is a hell of a drug. That guy's just shooting from anywhere, making good decisions, going between legs, going near post when it maybe isn't the best angle, still hitting the back of the net. I think the best thing that could ever happen to him was getting relegated, uh, <laughs> getting more minutes, getting to play in his best positions, getting more time on the ball to do his thing. Championship, difficult league to have success. Uh, Norwich ended up losing that, but they're still in third. We got Haji Wright scored two goals. I don't know if you think he's still part of the conversation. I don't. Natalia Spores, 3-2 loss. One was a good header. One was another one running off the shoulder. He just, I think hey, he, did really he just well. told you he doesn't, Jimmy. Let it go, okay? okay? Jordy, Jordy, Peefock, Jordy Peefock <laughs> had a hockey slash MLS assist in Union Berlin's second goal and a big 2-0 win over no, Bruce a, Dortmund. A, that was a real assist, not a hockey assist. He, All he right, the fine. ball, held it up, and laid it off. And was, That's right. It was a real okay, goal. fine. That's true. Hold but came, he came out with a knock in his knee in the 67th minute in that same game. Gio Reyna only came on as a sub for eight minutes, but I know we're talking about number nines right now. Ricardo Pepe went 90 minutes for Groningen, but they lost to Twenta 3-0. And he obviously didn't keep up uh, his goal scoring form as well in that one. And I don't think it's on him. Of course, it's a collective game. What are you saying? Jesus Ferrer plays tonight against uh, Minnesota United yeah. in the first round of the playoffs in Dallas. So be on the lookout for that. A any thoughts on our, our, our nines, resident number nine? 
Yeah, I would say, you know, in terms of Josh Sargent and his ability to continue to to, to have uh, a presence uh, up top for Norwich and score goals, that's big because he's had some downs, not getting called in, getting called in, not really running with that opportunity. It, it's very easy to to put your head down and, and, and not continue to produce at the club level, but he's he's staying focused. I think that's where he's grown and matured. So all he can do is continue to, to deliver. And you still have him off that, the team, or do you think that he's he's on the team? I think if he continues to score, he'll be on the team. But he he's got to keep it up. He can't he can't take his foot off the gas. And get in saying that, I think he Greg Berhalter would be smart to bring four strikers to to Qatar, and that means including Jordan Pifok because he's he's starting for Union Berlin. And I looked at that when I watched the the game in terms of his movement. You know, he's not the fastest. We know that. He's not the, the strongest, but what he does offer is he makes sure he gets in the box. He puts himself in, himself in good positions. And in on the goal, the second goal, he hold he won he he gets his position at the top of the box, uses his body well, holds off the player, and lays it off perfectly for for his teammate to smash it home. And and that's the type of of center forward play we need at times. And we don't always get that, especially with Jesus Ferrer, who's a little bit smaller and he likes to find the, the pockets and, and hopefully put, get it on the half turn. He's not holding off center backs pit, and, and being that pivot. Uh, Ricardo Pepe can do it. He, do, he doesn't do it often, but he can do it. And then Josh Sargent, again, another player who hasn't really done it as well in terms of holding off center backs and, and being a guy who can just you know lay it up to a midfielder who's coming on to, to hit it one time. So I think just because he has that different profile, you have to include him, especially if you go down a goal, you need to bring on a striker. That's where he excels, playing with two strikers, having support, someone right underneath them who can play around him. That's when PFUC really um, scores scores his goals and is much more dangerous. Not being a lone a, a striker who can play on an island, that's not his game. So uh, I think you have to include him. Okay, I like that. All right. Heath, I'm going to come to you next, but I'm just going to whip through a whole bunch of guys just so everybody knows how they performed, what they did. You can pick and choose. We're running a little bit long because we had a great interview with Alejandro Bedoya. Thank you to him for coming back on. And obviously, we had a great conversation about our center back situation, which isn't good. So as we mentioned, Walker Zimmerman out of the playoffs. DeAndre Yedlin playing tonight in New York City for Inter Miami in the playoffs. Uh, we have Matt Turner, who didn't play on the weekend against Leeds, but uh, obviously had a clean sheet midweek in the Europa League. Austin Trusty, 90 minutes, 2-0 win at Hull City. Malik Tillman just doing his best. Uh, Diego Maradona and Leo Messi and R9 Ronaldo just went through, I don't know, eight guys. The defending was terrible, but uh, you can only do and take what the game gives you, you know, and he did that and scored a great goal in Rangers 2-1 win over Motherwell. Joe Scally went 90 in a 2-2 draw against Wolfsburg. We have uh, Anthony Robinson, 90 minutes in a 2-2 draw against Bournemouth. Same with Tim Ream. Uh, Gio Reyna, as I mentioned, eight minutes before. Christian Pulisic, I want to get into him, actually, if we get a chance there. Kevin Paredes, 16 minutes in that 2-2 draw as well. Yunus Musa, this is important, 75 minutes in a 2-2 draw. Got the start against Elche for Valencia. Uh, Mark McKenzie, 90 minutes in a 1-0 win. That was a big deal right there. And who else is... Uh, Serginho Dest did not play against Helios Verona in AC Milan's 2-1 loss. so Or 2-1 win, actually. In that one. And then uh, Cameron Carter-Vickers, 90 minutes, 6-1 win over Hibbs. And I think that's pretty much it. We got Brendan Aronson and Tyler Adams that also went 90 minutes in a 1-0 loss to Leeds. Leeds created a lot of opportunities there. So yes. I don't know if we want to finish this off with, with Christian Pulisic not playing for Chelsea for two consecutive games, though he had scored the game prior to those two games. He seems to be out on an island. I don't know what the hell is going on. I'm trying to like look and to see what these other players are doing that he's not because he always seems to be an afterthought for Graham Potter, which is a little unfortunate. I don't know if we need to beat this dead horse again, but I'm a little nervous no, for don't. him in general. He needs a change of th change of scenery. Change of change scenery. Of scenery. Well, it, it was worst case. It was worst case scenario that an American ownership group came in at that time and a change of coach that like he's not going to fit in the new plans. But but with a new ownership group, I know there's a lot of marketing capabilities with the Christian Pulisic. He just needs a change change of scenery because so, it's, so it's obviously not happening. And Mason Mount's in the form of his life again. Yeah, so there's true, no true. That uh, Pulisic ha ends up having a good World Cup. Do you think American owners are going to sell him in the January transfer window? Absolutely yes. not. But so. Yes, yes, I think so. You think they will try to get peak, yeah, I, peak I, value for him? It's a yeah, business. Yeah, I mean, if, it's a business, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think, you know, he's, he's focused on all-star games and stuff like that. Fully, <laughs> so. All right, let's see. You want to talk a little Leeds then? Brendan Aronson, Tyler Adams. I thought Leeds did enough against Arsenal to created enough chances. Obviously, missed the penalty. 
to get a little bit more out of that game. But again, what I really like when I watch these games is those guys don't look out of place against the best team in the Premier League right now in Arsenal, Heath. Your team. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're good. And the 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 timing of it is going to be, and, and obviously I think Jesse Marsh is in a little bit of a hot seat because they're not in the best of form. But let's not forget that they are not the leads that we knew them as. They are leads that have recently promoted, and they've spent some money. And that money was on Americans. And those Americans are playing pretty well in the team right now. And you're starting to see more of a system come to life for longer periods of the game, obviously against an arsenal, like you said, there were enough chances to, to at least score um, or, or maybe sneak away with a point uh, at, at home. But, but this is one that I think uh, they're going to continue to get better and better. And while I think the pressure is going to be on Jesse Marsh from the fans and, and all of that stuff, uh, I think he's probably pretty secure there because if you look at the way in which they're playing and the way in which they're improving week in and week out, um, it's not necessarily reflective of the points. So hopefully they can turn that around. I'm not too worried about that, but the American guys, like you said, uh, I think are fitting in really well. Uh, Jack Harrison continues to get better as well for for those um, you know MLS fans out there that are following him. So I I, I think that the, I think that they're they're always going to be a few points away from being a middle to upper middle table team. Yeah, they need a number nine. I, I like Patrick Bamford, but he's missed yeah, he's way too many it. chances this year. Yeah, he's he's not not, not the guy, at least not consistently. So Charlie, final thoughts to you. We had a action packed episode this time around. We appreciate everybody hanging out with us. We got two more episodes for you this week on thursday and friday so make sure you join us for that final thoughts charlie yeah uh hell of an episode with right. alejandro bedoya i'm hyped for the games tonight and for thursday so um what what i would say is we we have some time before the u.s men's national team kicks off so hope for the best <laughs> hope for the best that's the final thought heath your turn <laughs> uh, hope hope for the best i agree that's best. why i'm leaving it too hope just, for the best we're just gonna hope for the best <laughs> Just That's it for me. Hope just, for the best. Let's go. Hope for the best. best. Hey, hey, we ain't in control of that. So hope for the best. Hope for let's the go. best, baby. All right. You know what, everybody? I don't know how your week's going to go, but we hope for the best. It's going to go extremely well, just like we hope for the best for our team in the World Cup. So on behalf of uh, producer Des, producer Alex, Charlie Chuck Wagon Davies, Holly Reed Pierce, I'm Jimmy Conrad, Dino Conrad, saying thank you for listening and watching In Soccer We Trust. And we'll see you next time. Later. <laughs>